My name is Eric Johnson, as you've already heard, um, and Waylena McCulley, our show producer at the Planetarium, you might see that she's got a relatively familiar background um, behind her, and she's going to move her camera around. I'll uh, make sure to put her on the spotlight instead here. Um, Waylena, where are you at right now? I am inside the planetarium. I don't get to spend much time here at all anymore. And as you see, it's very empty. So looking forward to the day when we can have everyone meeting here again for our programs. That's right. Let's the camera sure back. Those cases go down so we can open up again. That would be fantastic. I see you've got a space cat shirt on. That's great. Oh, yes, yes. I don't know if Ellie is still on, but uh, I always think of her when I'm choosing my space cat. Oh, I see Ellie in the audience, and I see that one S. Drake has mentioned that that is the second largest planetarium in the state of Illinois, but it is the first coolest. Yes, I, I do not mind when uh, S. Drake sh shares that information with all of us. Now, uh, Waylena, I see you also have a bowl behind you. What's the deal with that? Ah. So here in the planetarium, when we project the sky or a full dome movie or anything, we're projecting it up onto the ceiling, but the ceiling is, uh, well, it, it's a curved dome shaped surface. It's like a giant popcorn bowl that's up over our heads. What do you think? I know. Classy. Real styling. <laughs> so that this is, that is some wonderful prop right there. because what we project is, um, it's a video image. The final product is a video image that is a circle inside of a square. And with that, I'm going to start sharing my screen. Wonderful. Yeah, and I see that you've got another computer there. You'll have to tell us what that's all about. I'll, I'll switch to that. Yeah, I'll switch to that. I, uh, uh, in preparing for this presentation, I prepared a little bit that uses the planetarium software but I prepared most of it using other software that um, runs much better on a gaming computer that I have specifically for graphic stuff. So um, I'll be switching to that when we get um, past the sky parts. Uh, and also, uh, you know, the way things are, I never know when, you know, things are gonna have to close down again. So wanted to make sure that I had something set up to be able to run from uh, the road. So let me get the screen sharing. There we go. There's the circle inside of the, um, well, it's more of a rectangle than a square, but you get the idea. Let me see if I, I've got my little Zoom hovering menu getting in the way for me. There we go. All right, so this is the, the that image I talked about that would be projected up onto the ceiling. And this was earlier this evening at sunset. And I don't know if my mouse uh, is projecting the cursor very well, but actually I'll, I'll back up the sky just a little bit so we can see the sun right there getting ready to set. I can make it a little bit bigger. All right, now I'm gonna catch us up to the current time or maybe not the full current time, but a lot closer. So this is, all right, a little bit, a little bit later. So this is about 10 minutes from now. Okay. And um, I don't know, how well can you see this, Eric? I see stars. I see the Milky Way up there. The Milky Way is a lot brighter than you would see in the normal sky. Um, but I can easily see a couple of really well-known constellations. But, you know, I'm biased. I was actually outside two hours last night uh, showing stuff to students. So. All right. All right. So sometimes I do show um, a, a different, a bit of a different uh, version. I sometimes show uh, an enhanced night sky that, uh, <laughs> that I made modifying. I used a combination of a real all sky image and some changed settings on the uh, digital sky. And I'm going to put some direction letters that's going to be helpful for us as we go along. Yeah, this one's a lot easier for people to catch. So. And I'm going to 
do a little bit of zoom in so that uh, we're not just looking at the giant circle. So right now we are, um, in fact, also I'm gonna stretch it out on the edges a little bit. This is where it gets weird. Did that look weird? A little bit, but you know, yeah. I know what the purpose is for this, so. <laughs> so now I can zoom in a bit. And that lets us uh, that lets us see things in more detail. So there we go. Okay, I'm turning it a little bit to look toward the southwest. And even though it is spring, we are still getting to see our favorite wintertime star pictures. And of course, the most famous of those is Orion with the three stars that make the belt. And I just cannot, cannot resist. I have to show a few of those constellation pictures. I think I have the traditional Orion picture. But of course, we have a lot of fun with it here in the planetarium. I'll just go through them very quickly. Bow ties are cool. Another fun thing to do, folks, is if you have suggestions about other ways that we could display ways that you see Orion, feel free to share those because we yeah. love, we love adding to our repertoire. Yes. Love making new stuff. I really do. Mm -hmm. So Orion, very famous. The stars are so bright. They stand out very well in the winter sky and the belt stars. If we follow them off in this direction, they get us to this lovely V-shaped group of stars. I'll, I'll zoom in a little bit more on it. I don't want to go too far in. Here we go. So that V-shaped group of stars, that's the face of Taurus the bull. Uh, and most of those stars, not the bright one, Aldebaran, but the rest of them are part of the star cluster, the Hyades, beautiful group of stars. And it's really cool. If you've got binoculars, check it out. And while you have the binoculars out, look over this direction because you get the Pleiades, excuse me, air is very dry in here today so we have the pleiades also known as the seven sisters and uh, i know that last week eric you talked a lot about the pleiades and it was a really good time so encourage folks to check that out on the youtube i'm going to go over in this other direction and finish up the little bit of what's left of the winter sky we follow the belt stars the other way. We get to the brightest star of the whole nighttime sky. And the star's name is Sirius. It is also known as the dog star. And that's because it's the brightest star in the constellation of Canis Major, the big dog. Now that's a picture that um, was made for us by our former artist photographer Pam Fries when she was here with us and uh, it was I, I liked it a lot better than the traditional Canis Major which we couldn't figure out if it was really a cat or a dog and while it's no secret that I'm a cat person uh, I was kind of happy to have a big dog that dog that really looks like a dog I mean there's just no doubt about it yeah, it's a very small snout on that artwork. Yeah. yeah. So we've got, and my cats insist that it should be a cat, but you know, they're cats and they insist that everybody should be a cat. We don't let the cats in the dome either. <laughs> no. Only, only the, the cats on your shirt. Just the cats on my shirt. Yeah. Well, there is a cat in the dome, uh, at least one that we will get to as we move into the spring right. sky. Um, fair enough on that. We don't want to leave out Leo. Not, not at all. Um, so we do have Canis Minor and it's up here made of two stars. That is it. Two stars to make a little dog. And well, this is always the dog that we think of. Ah, uh, yes. 
Hopefully you folks aren't too hungry, but you're at home so you can go and grab a bite. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, we do have a, a little dog uh, artwork that's not too bad. So let me go ahead and bring that up like a little puppy dog. And those dogs, well, they are supposed to be Orion's hunting dogs. So they're supposed to be following him wherever he goes, but we know what they're really after. Definitely. By the way, Ellie mentions that she sees a princess that's like a hunter princess for Orion. Yeah. That's that works. Quite some fun imagination there. Excellent. That works for me. Oh, yeah. Right. Now, moving over to the, I'm going to just turn the view this way. Turn it out here, and I'm going to um, increase the field of view right there. Okay. So, the springtime sky. Well, I'm not going to do all of the springtime sky, but I do want to do Leo the lion. I love this one. So, um, yeah, when I start to see Leo right after sunset, um, you know, I know that uh, spring will be coming. And uh, when I started to see it after sunset <laughs> a little over a month ago, you know, we were still in that February cold. So it was very encouraging to me to be able to look to Leo in the sky and to know that, yes, spring is actually coming. So I'll go ahead and zoom in again and I'm going to tilt it up because otherwise we don't get it quite centered. So what we have for Leo is there's this backward question mark. And I'm going to try to annotate it. I'm not as uh, not as quick with it as uh, as Eric is, but I'll go ahead and see if I can. There we go. Connect to there. I should have done it lines instead of drawing. There's charm in this. You're fine. Okay, so backward question mark or uh, the top of a coat hanger, like the hook part of a coat hanger. And then over here, we have this triangle. And so these are the main stars of Leo the lion. So over here, this is supposed to be the head of the lion and this is the tail area. And uh, you could connect this if you wanted to. Honestly, though, I had a hard time picturing a lion when I was a kid. I really did. I kept picturing instead of a lion that's facing this direction, I kept picturing a mouse facing that direction. I don't know. What do you see? Well, I can at least show you a lion and a mouse because I do have those. Um, a planetarium that I worked at uh, previously had, uh, we had an alligator and we might've had one here at one point. I, I wasn't able to find it in the old slides. Mm -hmm. um, of course, a planetarium I worked at before I came here, there was a young lady that uh, came to all of the, uh, not all of them, but most of the weekly live sky programs. And Oh, she saw alligators in just about everything that she had an amazing imagination. She had the star chart and she was drawing out those alligators for me. It was, it was actually kind of fun. It really was. All right. So let me get a Leo the lion picture up there for us. I like how he's kind of leaping. Yeah. <laughs> Getting ready to pounce. So you ready for the mouse? Sure. Ellie sees a hippogriff or an opossum. Now, my mouse that I imagined when I was a kid was not this mouse-like. Mine was really more of a stick picture because I was not very good at drawing. Um, but I think this is really a cute one. It really is. Mm -hmm. Pam did a great job with it. This is Pam's, right? Yeah. Uh huh. So this is one of the uh, just really to me, this constellation just says springtime. It does. And I love it. And it's a great, uh, it's a great starting point after Orion. 
because you know Orion's great. You can point to all these different things, and then Leo is the next step. You know, when Orion is setting over in the west, you've got Leo nice and high up there. I will warn you, however, if you've been looking at Leo in planetariums or using planetarium software on the computer or on the phone. Oh my, when you go out and actually look at it in the real sky, it is always so much bigger, so much bigger than you think in your head. And when I was a kid, um, I had a hard time seeing it uh, when it was lower. So when it was rising or setting, I just couldn't see it. But it was in the right position that when it got to be that high point, I could see it very, very well. So let me go ahead and put uh, the Leo drawing back on it. I moved my screen. There you are. There's my Leo line. That works. Okay, I'll leave that up for right now. And I'm going to zoom out some more. Okay, now um, notice looking higher up. Now this is the full sky view. So looking straight up overhead would be right around in here. In fact, I could put a dot there for the point straight overhead. There, that green dot, that's the zenith, the point straight overhead, which on our sky map here is the, the just the smack dab in the middle. Um, I know I didn't get that lined up very well there. But notice as we uh, as we look as we look higher and then we are now looking toward the north instead of the south. This is where if you're looking like this, you might want to pause and then turn around to face north um, unless you're lying down because it's easy to lose your balance uh, if you're trying to look at stuff behind you by going like this. Um, but there's a famous group of stars over here. Am I know what they are? Well, let's go ahead and we'll go this way. No, we'll go this way. We'll face north. And now I'm going to zoom in. Now we know what that is. Of course, now we have the Big Dipper. And the Big Dipper is, um, well, Big Dipper is year round for us. It really is. It's circumpolar, it goes around the pole star, which by the way, we find it by using the Big Dipper to point to Polaris right there, the pole star. Um, so it's there all year long, but if you wanna see it, high up in the sky after sunset, that's where you want to be looking in late spring. Um, well, early spring, but you have to stay up an extra hour or two, but then it makes it nice and high up there. And uh, the Big Dipper, of course, very famous. Uh, and let me see if I can get some of the pictures for it available. Um, this is the part that's kind of funny because of when you're looking at it this time of year, it looks like anything inside of it is going to fall out. So this is where we can have some fun with it. Um, so it looks like uh, that could be a saucepan or if I change the scale, it could be like a measuring cup. You know, we got a few of those uh, in the kitchen at home that fit together. Um, oh, this one's fun. <laughs> yep, it's a wagon being pulled by a horse, and it is defying gravity at this time of year. Although, remember, there's no up or down in space. Now, ah, here's my favorite. So anyone standing there would get egg on their heads, right? <laughs> But there's lots of different ways that we can uh, 
upside down shopping cart, anything in the shopping cart would fall out. There's lots of different ways that we can imagine these same star patterns. But even though the Big Dipper is high up in the sky in the evening, in the spring, um, it's more of a year round constellation. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and turn off annotations and zoom back out. All right, so now I'm going to make it be later. If we were here in the planetarium, I'd be able to do these things a lot more smoothly because we wouldn't have this one screen to be focused on and I, I wouldn't have to do everything so quickly, but one at a time I could do them more fluidly and all at once. Let me take that Zenith dot off. We don't need that now. So we have Orion setting. Okay, so with this view, we have the Big Dipper and you see the handle makes a curve. And if you follow the curve, it leads us to the bright star called Arcturus. And the saying we use for it is arc to Arcturus. But then after we arc to Arcturus, we keep going and we spike to Spica. And I can try this. I don't know how it's going to appear on here, but we're gonna give it a go anyway. Now this is not with an annotation, but this is programmed in through the Digistar. There we go, arc to Arcturus. And then after we arc to Arcturus, we spike to Spica. Now here in the planetarium, if we're viewing this on the sky, it makes um, just a broad sweeping arc as, as we do it and, and in the real sky as well, of course. Um, a little goofy when we're looking at it on the just the flat screen projection, but you know, we do what we can. Just hold the monitor over your head. <laughs> And let me go ahead and get uh, the pictures. So Arcturus is the brightest star in the constellation of Bootes. Although when I was a kid, um, boy, I get to feel old. You know, back when I was a kid, we didn't have this fancy internet. Um, but it's true, we didn't have internet. And uh, all I had were books for uh, learning the star and constellation names. So my pronunciations were just way goofy. And so I always thought it was supposed to be called booties. It's what I joke about um, with all my students. But it's not. It's 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 Botez and it's supposed to be a herdsman. And I think if I called him booties, he'd be very tempted to, you know, bonk me on the head with that stick of his. Um, it's a neat, neat group of stars. I love the star Arcturus. It's so bright. It is not my favorite star. Those of you who have been watching for the last year know that that is a summertime star called Antares. But uh, it is a more orangish red star, like Antares is, and uh, it's kind of neat. You can get an idea of the star color. See, a star color gives us an idea of the temperature. The red and the orange stars are the least hot of the stars, and the blue and the blue-white stars are the hottest of the stars. And at this point, I'm going to zoom in somewhat because Arcturus and Spica I want to make sure we can see them pretty well here. There we go. Excellent. Arcturus is sort of an orange red color and Spica is a blue, blue, white color. And so you can really, really get that sense when you see them in the sky together. And that's an, an interesting thing about star color. It can be really subtle to the human eye. And uh, so if I look at, um, well, if I look at Orion, the Betelgeuse, the red star looks red even more so because Rigel is so blue. So having those comparisons really, really helps. It sure does. Uh, now, after you have Arch to Arcturus, in fact, I know we don't have the Big Dipper stars there, but I'll draw it out again. We arc to Arcturus and then spike to Spica. After we do that, 
we get to this cute little group of four stars here that look like a box that somebody sat down on and squished. I just think it's one of those fun ones. And when I see it in the sky, it's like, oh yeah, I forgot that one's there. And uh, it is a group of stars. I'm trying to find my picture of it. Oh my goodness, there it is. So, all right, so it is a bird and it's kind of a neat bird, although if you get a lot of them and they're being noisy, it can be really annoying. It's a crow. And the crow's name is Corvus. And the springtime sky has uh, a lot of these little constellations like this. And uh, let's see, there's one that I don't show very often and I need to reposition the screen and zoom it out a little bit. In fact, I'll just go ahead and cheat and I'll turn on one of its pictures and then I can position on that. Oh, I did it pretty well there. What would you say that is, Eric? Uh, it reminds me of a dragon with a flagon. <laughs> Close, close. It's the chalice from the palace. Oh, okay. It's this is my fault for never having watched a Danny Thomas movie. <laughs> or Danny Kay. Did I screw that up as well? It's, that's it's like right. I wasn't that's alive. Right. That's, a, that's, a, that's all right. Um, but yeah, it is a, it, yes, it's a it's a it's a fun movie scene. And um I know that um lots of other shows have done scenes where they they sort of incorporate the same thing it's sort of a it, it's like the who's on for first kind of joke so yes this is the chalice from the palace and it is a flagon with a dragon i i couldn't remember the other one yeah and it's also a vessel with a pestle yes the constellation is called crater and it is a cup so that's the constellation and that's where we we thought you know let's have some fun with it so we do we have the chalice from the palace and the uh, flagon with the dragon and the vessel with the pestle but even to this day i still cannot keep straight you know which one has the has the poison in it so uh, i'm just having some fun with the i'm seeing the quotes that i've now done my google search to uh correct my lack of knowledge of movies from 1955 so that's, that's, that's which i um i was born in 1970 so i just don't want anybody to think i was seeing it as it came out in 1955 <laughs> so, no no it was one of those uh, just delightful movies that i loved seeing anytime it came on the channel so i'm going to zoom us out again We've got a pun from S. Seekin over here, along with Canis. Is it a cup with a pup? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love yeah, it. I truly worthy of the court jester over here. <laughs> now I'm going to advance time. Actually, I'm going to cheat because we're not going to do this smoothly. Um, this is the springtime sky, and this is the springtime sky at uh, later this evening. So this is. Um, about 1130 at night and now I'm going to drag the mouse on the time to make it be much later. Oh, that's a different Milky Way there. <laughs> trying to get it, trying to get it to about or 430 now, about, okay, so that's about five o'clock. Now I don't want to keep going and have um, the sunrise just yet. But yes, we have the Milky Way visible here. And these are the stars of the summertime sky. And yes, we have some planets. I'm not gonna, we're not gonna do planets right now in this, in this time. But what I wanted to show, I'm gonna try to exaggerate the Milky Way. And I'm going to shift the topic to galaxies. Shifting to galaxies. Now, when we see this hazy band of light, through the sky, uh, we call it the Milky Way. We are indeed seeing our own galaxy edge on from the inside out. Uh, now, all the stars that we see, everything that we see here is a part of our own galaxy. Everything we see in our sky is a part of our own galaxy except for other galaxies. 
except for other galaxies. And um, boy, it turns out that any spot of sky you pick, if you stare out into space, you're going to find galaxies. And by stare, I mean point telescopes with really long exposure times because it's not what we're going to see with our eyes. Of course, remember, it's hard to see through our own galaxy where it's densest with stars. And if I put up let me see if I can do this here. If I put up the uh, some of the brightest galaxies, so these are galaxies that um, people discovered with smaller telescopes over time. You notice we're not seeing them right in here along the Milky Way. In fact, we're seeing them more back in the spring sky. And there's also some in the fall. In fact, if you've got binoculars, well, that's where the best galaxy to see with binoculars in the Northern Hemisphere is. And unfortunately, this is just not the best time of year for it. It's the fall sky. Um, so right now it's rising just ahead of the sun and setting just with the sun. So um, the Andromeda galaxy, it's there, but it is not, not something you're going to see very easily at this time of year. Now, I have seen a few galaxies, um, some around the Big Dipper I've seen with uh, binoculars, but honestly, it was just the tiniest smudge that I, I knew it was a galaxy. And so, yay, I saw a galaxy, but it was nothing like the pictures that you see um, or what you get with a, a larger telescope. Um, I did want to feature some of the galaxies that are out there, even though we can't see them with just our eyes uh, or, you know, if you don't have a big telescope uh, or even if you do, but the weather's just been lousy. So you haven't been able to take it out to look. And uh, that brings us back to Leo. And this is where I'm going to stop screen sharing here. And I will move over to the, well, I'm actually going to move the other computer here because I'm going to keep using the camera and the audio. So I'm going to stop the screen share on here. Did it stop the screen share? It did. It did. You're good. Okay, good, good. And I'm going to try not to drop anything here while I move this other I dropped something. Uh, that's all right. Gravity works. We've tested it. So <laughs> I know, right? And now I'm going to move the other mouse out of the way because I've learned from experience. I'll keep reaching for the wrong one. I mean, I was on the edge of my seat. I was hoping I wouldn't float away. So <laughs> all right. Now I'm going to share the screen on this one. This is my other persona. The other way, Lena, that's logged in. This machine doesn't have a camera or microphone on it, and I didn't want to be switching that many things. This is actually my husband's machine. I sort of stole it. And by stole, I mean just borrowed it. All right the opposite of a euphemism, you're fine. So this is, um, this is, I've got Stellarium, which we've seen in many times, uh, many of the Eric's presentations. Now I don't have it set up fancy, just wanted to um, go to the spring sky and go to the area of Leo, since we looked at that quite a bit. And as I zoom in, There's three galaxies right in here. And I can see it on my computer, but I don't know that they're showing up yet. That's why I was looking for the wrong thing last night. <laughs> Oops. What were you looking for? I was looking for the Leo triple E you found, but I was looking below the Iota star that's just down into the left of where you're looking right now. Uh, I wasn't looking okay. above and that, that was my mistake. I was I was doing manual uh, use of a Dobsonian telescope. So that's... That was my folly. I was going from what I could recall. We all have to learn sometime. 
Maybe yeah, I, I've gotten good at finding them just because I've been doing this in many pieces of software this week. Nice. Um, so this is uh, Stellarium on the computer and it using actual images, which, you know, you zoom in and there's, you know, you start to see some, some artifacts on it. But I'm going to get out of that for the moment. Oh, look at that. Or not, come on. It's still sharing Stellarium, isn't it? Well, I'm going yeah. to stop sharing and I'm going to share the whole monitor, oh, okay. which is what I meant to do. And I didn't. Well, it should be the whole screen. OK, here it started. And that's Stellarium. Sure, it's Stellarium, yeah. And I'm going to minimize Stellarium. There we go. OK, so this is a browser. And I've got it preloaded with a bunch of cool stuff. And one of them is a Hubble Deep Field image. Whew. Yeah, so tiny piece of sky, aim the Hubble at it, and just took many, many long, long exposure uh, photos, putting it together. and everywhere you see there's i mean the spiky things are stars so yeah there's if you see the things that look spiky those are stars yeah there's one down here yeah everything else is outside of our galaxy yeah yeah so comparing to just where those few ovals were in the previous where we were just looking at galaxies that were um that were known from smaller telescopes mostly the from the Messier catalog so many galaxies just any anywhere you look it's it's incredible and oh boy you know there's uh, so many different shapes to the galaxies uh now earlier when i said that the best galaxy to see is in the fall sky and that that's for the northern hemisphere i did want to point out that in the southern hemisphere there are two galaxies that are dwarf galaxies that are hanging around the outskirts of our own milky way and they're called the large magellanic cloud and the small magellanic cloud now the uh, idea of calling them star clouds was because well that's how they look well, so I've been told because I've not been to the Southern Hemisphere, so I've not been able to see them myself, um, but just incredible, the photos that I've seen. And early on, the galaxies that have these strange elliptical and spiral shapes that we see, um, they were uh, they were called spiral nebulae, nebulae meaning cloud, like space cloud, nebula. Um, it, it wasn't known what the nature of, the, of them originally was. And um, the answer finally came when they started doing spectra of stars, you know, being able to see all the little, um, the little, um, the little positions of the light for where the chemical elements are, kind of a neat thing. But they look at this star, oh, hey, it's got this characteristic. Look at that star, okay, it's got these characteristics. Putting together catalogs of all these stars. But then looking at galaxies, the spectra looked like you took all the types of stars and put them all together. And I thought that was a neat way to solve that. But uh, at that point, they were also being called island universes, which is just so fun. I just love that. Island universes. Uh, so all these galaxies that are everywhere, it's just mind blowing. Now I do have, yes, for the different galaxy shapes we use a classification scheme that goes from um, ellipticals that are well really round spherical right uh, to ellipticals that are more stretched out and then go to spirals but the spirals are divided up into I don't know, spirally spirals? No, spirals that uh, just have like a round center and then spirals that have a stretched out or like a, just a, like a bard. That's what the B is for, a bard spiral. And uh, uh, it, it, we like to classify things. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's kind of a neat thing. And if you would like to help classify galaxies, there is an internet project out there. It's been around for quite a while. It's been through several versions now. And I'll see if I can pull this up. 
no, I want to do the get started. Let's jump right to it. Now, this is called Galaxy Zoo. And uh, oh, good, good. Eric's got the link up there. And this is where uh, you get shown an image of a galaxy. Now, if you register and sign in, then all this is recorded and they can actually use this to, to help with the observation. So you take a look at the galaxy in the picture and then you answer the questions about it. And um, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's okay. It's kind of addictive at times. Um, there's also um, a project called Planet Four if you want to help classify Mars features. Um, but I wanted you to know about this because this is citizen science. This is something that you can do. If you've got a computer and internet, you can do this. It's just a lot of fun. It really is. And uh, some other things that you can try for yourself. Of course, um, you can use Stellarium to explore the sky. And we do that a lot. There's also a web interface for Stellarium. But then there's also um, Worldwide Telescope. And Worldwide Telescope, it is open source, but it's, uh, it's not multi-platform. It's Windows or web. So this is the web. Um, I do have it installed on the Windows machines, but um, I wanted to be able to demonstrate the web version. And I'm gonna go ahead and close it. And I'm going to just maneuver around a little bit and see familiar constellation patterns. Now I could turn those off, but I'm not gonna take up that much time. I'm just looking to zoom in on zoom in on that triplet of galaxies. Now here's something that Worldwide Telescope does. As I zoomed in, notice that the shortcut options and the addition options at the bottom changed. So um, what you can do here then is you can select these images and it will overlay the uh, the parts of the images. So this one here, uh, Mezzi 66, that's its catalog designation. And it's put up a Hubble image, which I can then crossfade up and down. Now that's a, a Hubble image that was made by um, after taking lots of observations and then putting them together and uh, cleaning them up in the best possible way. But what if you wanted to dig even deeper and see a lot of the, the raw images and the data that, well, maybe you really want to nerd out on it, you know, or just see what kind of stuff the astronomers work with. Well, that's where this next tool comes into play. It's called ESA Sky. And ESA is from the uh, European Space Agency. And um, this sky uh, software, this is through the web. So it's just through a web browser. Um, it's based on, I have a shortcut and it's, it's based on something called the Aladdin Sky Atlas. Um, I'm gonna click on Explorer. We'll do the science one after. So I'm using the uh, scroll wheel to zoom out. Yeah, they like to always start everything with Orion. And what you're seeing for the background here, this is not computer generated points um, in 3D space. This is a bunch of photographs put together of the sky. But I have a lot of practice at finding Leo. There's the question mark and then there's the triangle. And I'm going to just position this in here. So this looks just like what we saw with Worldwide Telescope. But now I'm going to enable the science mode. And some options have appeared up here and some numbers. So these are types of data that are available and the different catalogs. And I clicked on this one because this is what I was practicing earlier. And you have some to choose from. And let's see, HST, Hubble Space Telescope Optical. Now I just clicked on that and it has to calculate and now you see all these green boxes. These are uh, within the field that we're seeing. 
down below now are different observations. Now, this is not the finished products that we see. So um, anything that you click on is, you know, it's you can click on one of the boxes. That's a little tricky to do, uh, but it narrows down the selection down below. And some of these, some of the ones that are images have a preview. Otherwise you can download them and, uh, I just, you know, when I discovered this, I played around with it. And then I noticed that, you know, five hours had gone by because <laughs> I'd been having so much fun. Oh my gosh. Um, it really is just a, a, just a wonderful thing. And I did find on uh, the, the ESA Sky uh, information website that they actually have activity guides. And this is a fun one that I went through part of it. And so I do recommend it. And this is a, a student guide for the secrets of galaxies. It takes you through a little bit about, uh, about galaxies and what are they. You get that same tuning fork of the classification that we saw and just a little bit more about it. And then you get the activities, including activities that use the ESA Sky uh, online software. And so if you're interested in this and want to give that a go, it's a lot of fun. And you go through the activities and can check out a variety of, uh, of popular galaxies. And uh, then when you see, if you go through this, and then later on, when you see pictures of those galaxies, you have a better idea of what goes in to getting those images the way that we see them um, when we enjoy them on uh, various websites like, um, oh, there's the ESA site. There's also um, Noir Lab, which is, uh, yeah, this is what used to be the, um, yeah, National um, Astronomical Observatories uh, Association, their webpage. And uh, see all these, all these pictures and you get a better sense of what goes into making them. Now those galaxies that I've been showing, the triplet M66 group, because uh, one of the galaxies is uh, M66, that's its catalog designation. I thought, well, this is kind of neat being able to see this and then I was like, wait a minute, I've seen it recently. Oh, yeah, astronomy picture of the day. And um, it's, I think, one of Eric's absolute favorite websites on the internet. Is that right, Eric? It is real easy to get a lot of good images from there. <laughs> I, uh, you know, it's, it's like my favorite, uh, my favorite website on the whole internet is still spaceweather.com. Um, but astronomy picture of the day, I could see the appeal for that. Just really neat stuff. And uh, yeah, this was their picture on March 20th. So it was like, this was, you know, welcome to spring. We've got galaxies in Leo and Leo is the constellation of spring. Well, I know that we ran way over on, on this talk as well. Um, I'll go ahead and stop the screen share. I hope that you found something of interest uh, in, in the talk and uh, definitely we'll put this up on the web for, on, on YouTube for, uh, well, for folks that, you know, was past the bedtime. And uh, thank you all so much. Uh, Eric, you've been handling questions. I see that we didn't miss anything, right? Um, there was one question that I uh, got a really uh, lot of fun to uh, try to answer in as non-committal way as possible. <laughs> um, <laughs> what was that? One S. Seekin had asked when he saw the uh, Hubble's tuning fork model, he said, are the different classifications correlated to age, mass, or just a mix of characteristics? I said that, well, initially it was only organized by shape. 
um, if you want the nice technical term, that's a morphological classification. Um, and he thought that it actually did correlate with age. He thought they actually evolved along that model, but now we know that that is not necessarily the case. We also know how those shapes can be heavily disturbed yes. by collisions between galaxies or galactic mergers or acquisitions as well. You get a lot of galactic cannibalism out there. It's a lot of fun. Um, so, so no, we don't really, we don't uh, discuss the evolution like that anymore. Um, Ellie's got a question. Go ahead and uh, read that one there. Oh, what are my two favorite galaxies? Hmm, I don't know. I mean, obviously the Milky Way is one of my favorite galaxies since it's, it's home. Um, not sure of the other because um, now when I was a kid, I couldn't, I couldn't even see the Andromeda galaxy uh, because the light pollution was so strong where I was at. And I would stare with my binoculars at the spot in the sky, but it was all just this lit up gray and but I knew I knew that there was a galaxy in there and so um when I was able to finally see it getting out in the country skies it was like ha just triumph yes um I do know that it was um m51 that um I had the hardest time actually finding through a telescope this was before computer telescopes um, and I refused to use the, the setting circle dials. I was determined to do it by eye because that's how I'd been doing the telescopes there at the uh, uh, University of Toledo when I finally got to, you know, ha have a telescope of my own. Well, it wasn't my own, but, you know, <laughs> they let me use it. And um, I tried, oh, I had such a hard time finding that one in the sky, even though I knew exactly exactly where it should be so maybe that would be the other favorite just because just because it gave me such a fight in finding it mm. yeah that's a good one yeah i don't know if i have an answer for myself but i think that question was for you because this was your show so that's all right i'll i'll have to i'll have to look back and see all the times that i've posted galaxies on the planetarium's facebook page so yeah I'm sure there's plenty of them out there. Oh, you know what? I do have one answer. I mean, because my goodness, M83 is such a pretty galaxy. It is. Um, yeah, it's it's such a beautiful one out there. Um, I don't think I have this with me here today, but um, I did have M83 memorialized in uh, one way that uh, I think I have it for holding my some of my business cards. So you see that on the outside. Aww. Yeah, it's really cute. Um, and now M83, you get kind of mixed up with it because a French uh, band actually named themselves after that galaxy. So they're called M83. Um, wow. So, but it's just, you get, I mean, look at this picture here from the Hubble Space Telescope. I'm gonna share this link for you all. All right, Ta ding there you go. You just go ahead and look at that and just feast your eyes, all right? And here, I'll steal a shared screen so that you can see it here too, all right? Uh, okay, and I'll just click on that. Oh, look at that, folks. Yeah. Um, just seeing those beautiful dust lanes along there. And Ellie just asked a question about the difference between a nebula and a galaxy. When you're looking for a nebula, you see lots of little tiny nebulae inside of this image of this galaxy. Every little splotch of red, that's like a little nebula, okay? Um, and then there are a couple of different types of nebulae as well. It's not just areas where stars are being born along those, along those spiral arms, um, but sometimes you have nebulae where there's actually a single star that's dying as well. But yeah, nebulae are a lot smaller than galaxies. But it's a great question to ask because astronomers, uh, until 100 years ago, almost exactly 100 years ago, they didn't even know there was a difference. Well, it spiral was just, nebulae, they called the galaxies that's right. that were spiral, spiral nebulae. That's right. The Andromeda galaxy that you've been talking about was known until 100 years ago as the Great Nebula in Andromeda. The reason why we know it's now a galaxy is because they were able to figure out the distance to it. Okay. Yeah. Once they found the distance to it, 
they found out it could not possibly be in the Milky Way because it's 2 million light years from us. And that's one of the closer ones. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions, folks? All right. Well, uh, I'm going to steal the spotlight so I can talk. All right. <laughs> yes. Now you're back up at the top. Uh, <laughs> folks, thank you so much for sticking it out with us. Uh, we've had a lot of fun over these last two and a half hours. Um, this show will go up onto YouTube as well after it finishes converting and I share it with Elena and uh, she does the edits that Dr. Andrushik uh, goes in the request. Um, but uh, nevertheless, if you want to uh, hang out with us again next Friday, we will be doing another Prairie Skies for the spring. Um, and that'll be hosted by me and Waylene will be there as well. It'll be at seven o'clock on Zoom, uh, same URL, uh, same time that we usually start. Okay, so that's our, our bi-weekly show that we do right there. So yeah, thank you once again. Uh, have a good night. Enjoy your weekend. For those that celebrate it, happy Easter. All right. Bye. Bye.